Hi everyone, I'm Teresa Hobbs and I am a mind-body integrative coach. I help people to recover from chronic illnesses and chronic pain using mind-body and somatic-based approaches like pain reprocessing therapy, the safe and sound protocol, and nervous system regulation tools. Today, I wanna to talk about why mind-body illnesses, TMS, and neuroplastic drivers of illness and pain are not all in your head. One of the hardest parts of my experience with CFSME and all its many other symptoms was reconciling the underlying drivers of the illness. I'd been told it was all in my head, that I was just afraid, that it was just anxiety, that I was fine and that what I was experiencing wasn't real. And these things were incredibly shaming and they just induced more fear and unsafety and consequently more symptoms. Today, I wanna to explain the connection between the brain and some of these types of symptoms uh, in a way that's going to hopefully kind of take away some of the edge of shame. So, you know, when I was going through illness, I had heard about the mind body connection and I was, I was open to that, but I could not connect with brain retraining or any other concept that worked by, you know, convincing yourself that you aren't really sick. Those ideas made me feel like I was just pretending that I was sick or like all I had to do was change my mind about it and I'd be well, you know, like it was simply a choice. That idea made me feel like I was just choosing to be sick because it was benefiting me in some way. I also heard terms like secondary gains, which whew, even to this day, I hate that phrase. Um, these symptoms are not happening because we're gaining something. They are happening because our brain is desperately trying to protect us from something. When you gain something, you are playing offense, much like gaining yards in a football game. When you are protecting something, you are playing defense. There is a vast difference between the two. Since I've recovered, I've come to more deeply understand the how and why of it all. And so I'm going to explain it to you a little bit here today. So first of all, CFS ME, chronic Lyme, long COVID, chronic pain, post-viral syndromes, multiple chemical sensitivities, fibromyalgia, and many other similar invisible illnesses are real. The pain is real. The symptoms are real. The inflammatory markers are real. The sensitivities are real. And the brutal suffering is real. To acknowledge the role that the brain plays in these illnesses does not delegitimize them. To acknowledge the role of the brain does not equate to saying that someone can just change their mind and they will no longer be sick or in pain. Brain-driven pain and symptoms are not a choice. They are a normal phenomenon of our human biological, psychological, and social makeup. In historical environments, this programming has worked very well for us. In our current environment, which has evolved faster than at any other period of human history, this programming is being tested and we've and you know we're having to upgrade our software with patches, this is my analogy, in order to function well. I believe the pace that information, technology, and communication are coming at us is faster than our original human hardwiring and programming can keep up with. The majority of inputs our brain receives are held beyond our conscious awareness. We're surrounded by thousands of people and all the ways they make sounds, vibrations, smells, social cues, contact with each other and exchange energy with each other. These people all have various opinions and alliances and belong to different social groups. We're also juggling inputs electronically, which brings all of these things to us at the click of a button. You can go onto social media and take in hundreds of other people's thoughts and ideas within an hour. That's a lot of inputs coming into your brain on any given day. For most of human history, life did not move this quickly. So we're living in a different time with a lot more for our brains to process, which is part of the reason so many people are experiencing such extreme mind-body symptoms. This isn't a character defect. It's just what can happen when you mix our innate human wiring and programming with fast paced changes to our environment and culture. And that's okay. It's important to know how our brain and body work together so we can support better mental, emotional, and physical health. So did you know that the primary reason your brain turns on a pain signal is to prevent injury and tissue damage, not simply in response to tissue damage? The brain will turn on a pain signal before tissue damage occurs. 
you can test this out by trying to bend your fingers backwards. So your brain sends a signal before you've, before you've hurt yourself. So you won't hurt yourself. So there's a point when, you know, you pull it back and you start to feel pain and you know, like, okay, don't do that further. Now I have not injured my finger. My finger's just fine. My brain was trying to prevent that. Now, if there has been tissue damage to an area of the body, the brain turns on a pain signal to prevent further tissue damage. So if you break a leg bone, continuing to use that limb could cause further damage. Because the brain has this ability and tissue damage does not always equate to pain, we know that the brain can turn on pain signals when it perceives a threat to the body. The story of, um, it's a great story of this construction worker who stepped on a nail. And I think it illustrates this, this concept really well. So this man was working on site and he had stepped on a nail and it went all the way through his boot. So he looks down, sees the nail coming through his boot and is instantly in excruciating pain. And so they, you know, took him to the hospital and at the hospital he was given pain meds and then they slowly cut off the boot. And after the boot was removed, they saw that the nail had gone directly between his toes without having damaged any part of his foot. When he recognized that there was no damage, the pain immediately went away. The opposite of this happened to me when I was a kid. I was peeling an apple with one of those old like apple peeler kind of things. And I noticed, I noticed this little spot of red on my finger. I didn't feel any pain at all. And I assumed for several minutes that it was just the apple peel until I realized it wasn't brushing off. And then I recognized that it was actually a spot of blood. Upon this realization, I instantly felt pain. In this case, I didn't feel pain until I realized there was a tiny injury and my concern over the blood caused my brain to turn on the pain signal. Now, had I not noticed, my brain had already determined that the damage wasn't severe enough to warrant protection or immobilization through a pain signal. So this also happens to men in the heat of battle. They can be injured, but the brain will prioritize getting away from additional gunfire before alerting the body, uh, the body to a bullet wound. Now, in many ways, the brain is pretty smart. If you sprain your ankle running away from a tiger, your chances of survival are better if you can continue running than if you stop and try to take care of the injury. In cases like that, the brain will delay the pain signal until you've reached a place where it's safe to be immobilized. So we know symptoms and pain are not always indicative of actual injury. We know that the brain controls these processes and that the brain can turn on signals to any perceived threat from the past, present, or future. We also know that the brain can turn on a physical symptom in reaction to perceived physical, mental, social, or emotional threat. When a person experiences chronic stress or has a history of trauma or adversity, the brain can tag some of those emotional events as a threat and misjudge its response. It's not just pain signals that the brain will turn on. It can turn on the immune system, complete with all the immune markers. It can turn on nausea, dizziness, and can turn on symptoms that create dysregulated autonomic ner nervous system functions like POTS, orthostatic intolerance, tingling and vibrations and all kinds of strange sensations all over the body. Now, just like when you break a bone and you feel pain, if your brain perceives danger and turns on a pain signal somewhere in the body, that pain is also real. All pain is created in the brain. So it's irrelevant if there is tissue damage or not. It's experienced exactly the same way. An immune response to a virus is just as uncomfortable as an immune response to a misperceived virus or a misperceived pathogen or a misperceived toxin. The body is physiologically responding in the same way. So it's not all in your head. It's not dreamed up. It's a glitch in the brain because sometimes the brain cannot distinguish the difference between an emotional threat or a physical threat. And sometimes the brain cannot distinguish the difference between a past threat, a present threat, or a future threat. So thinking about what happened in the past or could happen in the future, all of that happens in the now to the brain. This is why phobias can wreak so much havoc because the fear cycle keeps the brain believing that the threat is real and alive right now. Now, in addition, I want to talk about some, uh, some other things called social contagions. Now, this is also a real human phenomenon, and it's not relegated to people who don't cope well with emotions or to people who are mentally weak. I'll give you an example of COVID. <clears throat> so a couple weeks ago, I was watching a podcast from a doctor named Dr. Zubin Demania. He's known as Dr. Z to a lot of people. 
And he was retelling his experience with finally getting COVID after not having had it until 2024. Um, he'd been podcasting all the way through the pandemic, offering really great sound advice as a doctor, but he'd never experienced it himself. So he finally got it and he'd been sick for about a week and was starting to feel a bit better. And then suddenly he started to feel kind of off, a little wonky. Um, he was feeling kind of weak and lightheaded and just, you know, just not, not great. So he decided to grab his oximeter and to test his oxygen saturation. And when he did this, he watched it go from 100 and slowly drop down into the 80s. And when it did that, he got totally freaked out. And he described what sounded like a panic attack. Now, as a doctor, he knew, you know, about all the cases where someone was on the mend and then started experiencing, you know, low oxygen levels. And though he wasn't thinking about this consciously, his unconscious mind had filed this information away. So eventually he decided to go get checked out and went to the doctor and they hooked him up to their oxometer and it was fine, 100% saturation. The doctor saw no issues, but Dr. Z wanted to see, um, you know, what happened when he stood up for a few minutes. He'd heard about POTS connected to COVID. And so he was just curious. He wanted to explain what had happened on the other oximeter. So as he stood and watched the oximeter, you know, with all the doctors sitting around him, it went from 100 and it dropped down to the 80s again. So, of course, this freaked everybody out and they all decided that, you know, the best idea was to do a CAT scan, make sure everything was okay. He'd had some, um, some genetic... Uh, markers that predisposed him to clotting disorder. So he wanted to make sure he didn't have a clot in his lungs. And, you know, they thought this would be the best thing to do. So do the CT and everything looks totally normal on the scan. And they were all just like baffled, you know, relieved, but baffled. So they tried the experiment again, only this time Dr. Z was standing facing away from the oximeter. Um, so he couldn't see, you know, the measurements and what they were doing. And when he did this and he stood up, it stayed at 100. So... I, I love this story so much. You know, this doctor is well aware of the mind-body connection, but even he was getting conflicted about the fact that his brain could actually alter his oxygen levels. None of this was conscious. And just to add, this doctor is a diehard meditator. He's super chill. He doesn't get anxiety. And he had never had a panic attack before. What he did have in common with nearly all the rest of humanity was the narrative of COVID and what it did, what it could do, and what to look out for. And all that information was stored in his brain. So we all want certainty. And sometimes our brain will give us something we expect in order to resolve the need to know what to expect. We base our ideas about what to expect on other people's experiences. You know, ask yourself how important it has been to hear about other people's experiences with illness to help you either normalize your own, to give you an idea about what could happen, or even if it's possible to heal. Now, if there's a social contagion of illness, there can also be a social contagion of recovery and healing. Remember that and keep seeking out stories that show how people shifted their symptoms and conditions because we can use this brain thing to our advantage. While there is a massive brain component to many of these unusual, often difficult to diagnose and explain mystery symptoms, it's not all in your head. It's not a character defect. And if this, uh, if this is part of your overall illness or pain picture, it does not negate your experience or mean that it's not real. It's all real. And I hope that this has helped you to maybe consider or lean into the power of your brain in connection with these types of symptoms. Stay tuned for more videos, and I'll be sharing more about how to work with your brain to turn off these symptoms so you can recover and get your life back. It's possible to heal, and when we heal these physical symptoms, we also expand our capacity to be present and vital in our lives. What might be possible for you? Stay curious about that, and I'll see you again soon.